Hi, good morning. My name is Gabriel Gonzalez, and in today's lecture, we're going to answer the question, can you disinherit your spouse? All right, some quick disclaimers. I am not a licensed attorney. I am not qualified to practice law. I'm not qualified to give any type of legal advice in any way, shape, or form. Um, this video should not be construed as legal advice in any way, shape, or form. The purpose of this video is strictly for educational and informational purposes only. If you're looking to get any type of elder law or legal advice pertaining to elder law or estate planning, I strongly suggest that you speak to a licensed elder law estate planning attorney in your area of jurisdiction. Without further ado, let's look at our question. Can you disinherit your spouse? Well, the answer to that question is, it depends. Now, why do I say it depends? Well, for the most part, in many states, including the state that I live in, in the state of New York, each state has what's called elective share statues. So, for the most part, in many states, in particular the state that I live in, the state of New York, you can't disinherit your spouse. Now there are some exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, you can't disinherit your spouse, okay? The state doesn't want you to put your spouse in the type of situation where they're in financial destitute, okay? Especially if, you know, they were receiving some type of spousal support throughout the marriage, okay? So many states have enacted what's called elective share statutes. Meaning that if you are still married up to the point that you pass away, even if you didn't leave anything in your will or trust to your significant other, the law does entitle that significant other to some share of the remaining estate. Now that share of the remaining estate is dependent upon state law. State laws have different variations of what's called elective share statute. Um, in some states, they would um, base it upon how many years you've been married. So, for example, if you've been married, let's say, two years, you would be entitled to 20% of the estate. If you've been married for five or more years, you'll be entitled to 100% of the estate. But in the state of New York, we have elective share statute. So if you are still married up to the point in time that you pass away, and you didn't leave anything in the will or trust for your significant other, for your significant other, then the law states that the surviving spouse is entitled to the greater of to the greater of $50,000 or one third of the value of the estate, whichever is greater, okay? So in the state of New York, you're, the, the, the surviving spouse is entitled to the greater of 50,000 or one third of the value of the estate, whichever is greater. That is the New York State elective share statute. Uh, New York State may also call it what's called spousal right of election, okay? Now there is a period of time that the surviving spouse has in order to file the spousal right of election. There's a small statute of limitation, okay? So the statute of limitation, all right, for that surviving spouse to file a claim against the estate under spousal right of election is six months from the date that letters of testimony and I apologize for my spelling if I misspell that or letters of administration I probably misspelled that and you know what I'm just actually gonna fix that I'm sure somebody out there is saying that Gabriel writes like a doctor I will take that as a compliment because I think doctors are very smart people. Okay, so
So, the statute of limitations of the state of New York for that spouse to file a claim against the estate for spousal right of election is six months from the date of letters of testimony issued or letters of administration issued. Now, real quickly, do you guys know the difference between letters of testimony versus letters of administration? So, in a situation where you have a will, if you have a will at the time that you've passed away and that will is probated in court and the, the surrogate's court validates that that will is actually valid, the court will empower the elective um, executor to actually, you know, do the process of administering the assets to the uh, beneficiaries in the estate. So when you have a will and you have an appointed executor in that will and the judge determines that that will is valid, that executor will receive from the court letters of testimony which empowers the executor to carry out the terms of that will. Now in a situation where you don't have a will or the will has been determined to be invalid, then as I mentioned in my previous videos, intestate succession laws become the uh, guideline and the primary source of authority in terms of the administration of that estate. So the court will actually appoint an administrator, kind of like an executor, okay, to administer the assets of the estate. Again, going back to what I mentioned in one of my earlier videos, I remember I mentioned about this famous C word, control. Either while you're alive, you actually do the proper planning in place to appoint an executor, or you leave it up to the courts to have that kind of control. The choice is up to you. So that's really the difference between letters of testimony versus letters of administration. Testimony is when you have a will and you already appointed someone in your will to be an executor, and if the will is valid in court, that executor would handle the affairs of the estate, whereas letters of administration is when you don't have a will or you have a will, but the will has been proven to be invalid. And then the, uh, the intestate succession laws would then, in essence, uh, be, the determining be the guidelines in terms of how that asset would be distributed. And then the court will appoint, kind of like an executor, but they're called an administrator, to handle the affairs of the estate, though. Okay. Now, the interesting thing, and I don't want to segue into that, though, when it comes to letters of administration, under the Surrogates Court Procedural Act, there are actually ordering rules which dictates who gets to be in an administrator, okay? So it's not like the court can pick anyone, but again, you still have a control factor that you still have to take into consideration, but the Surrogate Court's Procedural Act has certain ordering rules as to who would actually get appointed an administrator, Okay. So, I didn't want to segue too deep into that, but I do want to make a point that as soon as the letters of testimony or letters of administrator have been issued, the surviving spouse has at least six months, that's the statute of limitation, six months from the date of letters of testimony or letters of administrator, administration issued to file a claim against the estate under spousal right of election. And again... The New York State spouse right of election, the spouse is entitled to the greater of 50000 or one-third of the value of the estate. Okay? So, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what the um, spouse right of election is. However, is there a way to go around that? There is a way to go around that, and under very limited circumstances. Uh, the first one would be divorce. So if somehow you were able to time it right, okay, which timing is, uh, you know, I don't know, that, that would be a little difficult, but if somehow you were able to time it, that you were able to divorce your spouse before you died, again, I'm not sure how that could be possible, right, because how do you actually know if you're going to die? Well, I guess in some instances you could know that if you're going to die or not, you know, if you had an illness or whatnot, but anyways, a divorce would... Um, uh, a divorce would void the spousal right of election. So if you were divorced at the time that you had passed away, then the surviving spouse, well, 
although he wouldn't be legally considered a spouse anymore, would not be entitled to spousal right of election. Another circumstance where a spousal right of election wouldn't apply would be in a situation where, let's say, the spouse, and at the time of prior to getting married, you signed a prenuptial agreement, and you also write, you also drafted an agreement, a waiver, stating that the spouse waives the right to spousal right of election. So it's not just creating a prenuptial agreement. You also have to create a separate agreement called a waiver, um, and that spouse has to sign that they do waive the right to spousal right of election. So under those circumstances, either a divorce or signing some type of waiver agreement stating that, you know, they waive the right to spousal right of election would be under those circumstances where a surviving spouse, for lack of a better term, would not be entitled to exercise this right of spousal right of election. Okay, thank you very much for listening to my lecture today. Have a nice day.